I'm just sharing my screen. So is my screen visible to all? Yes. Yeah, your screen is visible. You need to be a little louder, Gaurav. Yeah, so is it okay now? Yeah, we can see it. Great. So it's an honor to introduce Sheetal sir. And we are following uh, whatever he is teaching us in pediatric sports injuries. And whenever I am stuck in my cases in pediatric trauma, I always reach out to sir and sir is very kind to respond to me on WhatsApp. Thank you, sir. So sir is a professor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Sir has done his masters from Ahmedabad as Molin sir told and then Sheetal sir did multiple fellowships in Canada and US. His interests include patellar instability and pediatric ACL tears apart from other pediatric sports uh, trauma. Sir got a patellofemoral fellowship award in 2013 and 14. He has published extensively in pediatric sports medicine and is an editor of pediatric ACL and patellar instability book. He has been on editorial board of orthopedic clinics. He has been on the editorial board of Chinmay. Can you mute the participants, please? Thank you. He has been on editorial board of orthopedic clinics of North America and orthopedics today. He is the IFIX faculty. Uh, uh, he has presented his work at various national and international meetings. He has been involved in teaching activities at courses and annual conferences and has organized several international surgical mission trips. So with this brief introduction, I would uh, invite Sheetal sir to take the talk. After the talk, we'll take all the questions. So anybody who has uh, any question can, can put it on the chat box and we'll take those questions after the talk. And then we have one interesting case by Sheenam. So Sheetal sir, please start the talk. Can you, uh, can you see my screen? I'm just stopping my screen share so you will be able to share now. Yeah, I, now we can. See yeah, you. great. Can you see the screen? Okay, yes, and, can you, yes. and you can hear me fine, right? Very yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Uh, you know, talking with everyone here. Um, I hope that this would be a little bit more interactive. Uh, so thanks, Molin, for the invitation and Gaurav for the introduction. Um, I always enjoy, uh, you know, talking about uh, pediatric trauma. And as Maulin said, you know, I would uh, recognize our mentor, uh, Dr. Pankaj Tivetia, who, you know, passed away a few years ago. Um, he's the one who introduced us to uh, nailing, though uh, at that time we used to use uh, Ender's nail and, uh, and not uh, the elastic nails that we currently use. But um, he was a big fan of nailing compared to plating for several reasons, you know, including cost and low rates of infection. Um, and uh, we did nailing for almost every bone and every fracture, every long bone uh, fracture, including intertroch fracture. We used to do Ender's nailing for those uh, as well. So we were very fortunate, uh, you know, from that stand up, you know, from that standpoint, we were fortunate that we got uh, introduced and uh, we had a uh, lot of experience with uh, nailing coming out of uh, residency. But at the same time, the downside was that we hardly did any pediatrics. So as Molin said, you know, even though we practiced pediatric orthopedics, uh, it was after the residency that, uh, that uh, we uh, got trained uh, in peds. But uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge him for for all his uh, teaching. Uh, so Anders Nail, I just uh, brought up the topic. It was introduced uh, uh, in Steyr in uh, Austria. And um, <clears throat> this is the original article uh, from Ender. Uh, the, the issue with the Ender Snail was that there is an eyelet which makes a nail um, very prominent. Those were stainless steel implants. So there was significant difference in the rigidity of the implant versus the pediatric bone. Uh, the principle of stacking means that you had three or four nails, which made the nails even more prominent. That means that there were issues with, uh, you know, 
uh, skin uh, uh, necrosis, prominent implants, and um, uh, angulation at the fracture side because most of the nails were introduced from one side. And then um, uh, the, the good things about Anders nail, it was very easy to remove because of the eyelet. They were very cost effective uh, because they were stainless steel um, uh, nails and um, they were readily available. So, um, so we used a lot of Anders nail during our residency and this was publication from 1970. And then the uh, Nancy nail was introduced in Nancy, France by Matazo, who also introduced uh, you know, several other things uh, besides the uh, nail there, Matazo techniques. This is the original um, book that was published by Matazo. This is the first patient that they did uh, in 1979. And this was using the nail, but not the principles of elastic nails, because you can see there was stacking of the canal. There were three nails used and uh, there were um, uh, probably maybe even four nails, not really sure, three or four. And then... Um, uh, from both sides. So uh, not exactly balanced nail principle, but this was the first time that it was used in a patient. And then uh, Lascombe's uh, later propagated, uh, translated the, um, uh, the book into English. Uh, and it, this is really a good book. Uh, if you can, if you're doing a lot of nailing, I would recommend that, uh, that you read this book or at least uh, go through it. Uh, several examples and, you know, they use elastic nails for almost every fracture, including supraconda fracture, as shown here from the book. I've taken some pictures um, and they use it for, um, you know, metacarpal fracture, phalangeal fractures, as you can see here. So a lot of uh, uh, extended indications of using elastic nailing. And, uh, you know, we looked at our complications because I'm always interested in the complications of a technique or of an implant. And um, there were several complications. So my talk is mainly, uh, you know, compilation of, uh, of all the complications that we, that we have seen. We go through um, each uh, category. And so that would um, bring out the underlying principle of, of Anders nailing. So as far as the fracture selection, uh, some of you may have seen the case because I've presented this at IFIX in the past. But um, for those who have not uh, seen it, uh, these are interesting cases uh, where there were some complications. So, uh, so you can learn uh, from these um, from these mistakes. Uh, so here is a 12 year old male who was uh, wrestling. Um, his weight was 35 kilograms. So well within the tolerance limits of 50 kilograms for, uh, for nailing. Uh, the only thing uh, that is um, unusual here is the spiral along oblique nature, along with uh, a very high extension of the fracture. Um, and so it's considered to be a length unstable fracture. We used uh, two nails here. Uh, 3.5 on table it looked fine but three weeks later the patient had uh, four centimeter shortening and the nail had backed out so uh, the thing is that is this something that we can you know allow to heal and then later on address it we can but that would require lengthening so at three weeks um, if uh, something could be done to bring out femur to length would be ideal a uh, few things that could be done you know one is what what was done here is used a plate that was um, used in a submuscular fashion uh, just to bring it out to length. Other things you can use is an X fix, um, or you can do an X fix with elastic nail right from the outset when you're putting nail if you think that it's going to um, collapse. Um, so the ideal indications are length stable fractures, diaphyseal fractures, and weight less than 50 kilograms for femoral uh, fractures and age less than 11 years. So these indications are kind of guidelines. And once we start doing more nails, then certainly the guidelines are uh, kind of fuzzy and we extend our indications quite a bit. Um, here is uh, an extension. Um, you know, if you look at the AOS guidelines for, uh, for femur fracture treatment, then up to five years, uh, the spica cast is what is recommended. But lately, at least here in the US, uh, for preschool children that is two to five years age, there is increased use of flexible nailing. And uh, the cited advantages, uh, you know, this, this article is still not published, is an online, uh, you know, just this month it came out. Um, and it shows faster return to normal activities with nails, 40 versus 47. Now you can debate how much difference would it make, you know, getting to normal activities one week earlier. Um, 
but lower incidence of malunion. Again, in, in this age group, things are going to remodel, so it may not be too important. Um, and it did require longer hospitalization by one day with the nails compared to spica, and then it required two surgery. One is to put the nail in, and second one is to remove it. So whether it's worth it, you know, depends on where you practice. You know, spica cast is still a great treatment, but just letting you know that, you know, flexible nailing, the, uh, the age has been extended, uh, you know, to the normal recommendations. So this is a two to five year age group. Um, for, for TBR nailing, uh, there has been no difference in the outcome between younger or older, heavier or lighter kids. So basically skeletally mature patient, if you think it's unstable, you can um, uh, choose to uh, use uh, elastic nails for the tibia. So in femur, the, the issue is that if the patient is really heavy or older patients have a higher rates of malunion, but similar things have not been seen in tibia. So um, there is uh, no higher limit. So, you know, we'll go through some cases where you can, when you would do um, a rigid nail for, for tibia instead of a flexible nail. Uh, here is, uh, you know, um, a publication from, from our um, Indian faculty um, on elastic nailing with x fix versus bridge plating in combinated pediatric femoral shaft fracture. And they did a competitive study. And you can see that um, right from the beginning, they put an x fix on so that, uh, uh, especially if you have a length unstable fracture or a segmental fracture where you think it might uh, collapse, you can put uh, uh, an X fix on it uh, till it uh, consolidates, which may be three or four weeks, and then you can remove the X fix. Uh, so they compared this with uh, uh, with the bridge plating, and uh, uh, so this is also an option for length unstable fracture is to plate these uh, fractures. When they compared the two groups, they did not find significant differences. Um, uh, and there were some pin track infection with uh, x fix some nail prominence, and with plating, there were deep infections. So what you would expect with, uh, with the uh, routine surgery is nothing unusual, but both were equally effective um, and acceptable treatment options. When we look at, uh, you know, in uh, what are the risk factors for malunion or for uh, uh, issues with uh, loss of reduction uh, in these fractures, these articles summarize it. And if you look on the right side, the common theme is when the fractures are not in the mid diaphysis. If they are proximal, like subtrope fractures, or if they're distal, like supracondyl fractures, then you don't have that balanced nailing principle, you know, which can be applicable. And um, these fractures do end up with some uh, malunion or loss of reduction. Uh, same with uh, combination um, or mismatch nails, uh, which is against the principle of elastic nailing, both nails have to be the same size. Uh, we looked at, uh, you know, a six year period where we looked at elastic nailing for pediatric subtrope and supracondyl fractures to see how we did. And um, it was similar to previously published series. The, the, uh, we looked at 36 subtrope femur fractures and you can see that almost one in five patients had one of the complications. So higher complication rate when you go for subtrope fractures. We still use it. This is my choice of treatment. It's just that when you're familiar with the complication, you can try and avoid it. You know, there were two malunions for repositioning or removal of nails. Um, one had a fracture, one irritation, one limb length discrepancy. So significant complications. So I would be careful. And if you have other, you know, implants that you're familiar with or you like to use uh, 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 plates, uh, then this would be a good uh, choice for a subtrope fracture. Uh, we looked at eight supracondyl femur fractures that were treated um, with, uh, with elastic uh, nails, and they had even higher complication uh, rate. Uh, you know, for these distal fractures, you have to come from the top. So these are anti-grade uh, uh, nailing principles uh, where one nail is an S-shaped nail, one nail is a C-shaped nail. You do have a little bit of prominence over the choke enter. Sometimes you can get a little bursitis there. And at one patient with infection, even after removal of the uh, of the implants, the patient continued to have issues around the trochanteric bursa. So uh, uh, try and avoid this nail unless you're in a situation where you have to salvage, uh, you know, uh, a really bad fracture. Then uh, then you should have this, uh, you know, uh, in your um, in your toolbox to use uh, integrate nailing. When you look, when you're using S-shaped or C-shaped nails, you don't need to bend the nail in an S-shape. You still bend it 
just like you would bend any other nail, like a C-shaped bend. But when you're past the fracture, then you just rotate it 180 degrees and the nails are flexible enough that it would just take an, take an S shape. So don't try to mold or you know curve the nail in an S shape before you insert it. You still go in as a C-shaped nail and just turn it 180 degrees once you cross the fracture and it would, be, it would take up the S shape. As far as a technique, uh, so the, these are the ideal technique where you have two crossing points in the femur. You can see that there is one crossing point here, one is here, the, you have maximum spread at the fracture site and you need to end just at the level of the physis here. You can go a little bit longer depending on the level of the fracture where your tip ends, but this is an ideal technique. Two nails, both, uh, both are of the same size, occupying about 80% of the um, internal um, uh, canal. Um, as far as the um, uh, forearm is concerned, the ideal technique, again, each nail occupies about 80% of the canal, 70 to 80%, and uh, the tip of the nail should be pointing towards the other bone. So the tip of the ulna nail pointing towards the radius and tip of the radius nail pointing towards the ulna, that is to maintain the interosseous space uh, uh, between the two bones. So this is how it looks uh, after we have fixed it. And um, if you have an improper technique, then you would lead, it would lead to some complications. Uh, in this example, you can see the nail is not crossing at just two points, but it's crossing at four points. That means there is a snaking of the nail uh, over the other nail. It, it's just a sign of difficulty. There is uh, obviously various angulation at the fracture site, along with distraction. Um, and uh, the nail sizes, the sizes are different as well. So it's an improper technique and uh, then you can expect uh, uh, complications. As far as the insertion sites are concerned, I prefer to use a radial entry nail um, uh, for the radius. Uh, there is the uh, nerve in this area, the um, uh, uh, superficial radial sensory nerve. Um, so I would recommend not to do percutaneous insertion of uh, of nail, um, I, I make a small incision, maybe about a centimeter and a half just uh, below uh, the level of the styloid process and at the level of the physis. And uh, I mean, I so, I'm sorry, just a little bit uh, uh, proximal to the physis. And then um, I, I don't try to find the nerve, but if I see the nerve, then I would uh, uh, retract it. Uh, St uh, studies have shown um, nail uh, injuries or stretch of the nerve, which can lead to numbness around the thumb. And there were more injuries um, uh, related to the nerve at the time of hardware removal rather than hardware insertion, because the nerve is scarred, you go in, you can't see it. So um, during removal, there have been higher instances of nerve issues. This is a cadaveric dissection showing uh, the nerve um, and its relationship to the other structures. I usually um, make a small incision um, and then I would like to see the nerve retracted dorsally. Then you would come across the tendons of the uh, first uh, dorsal compartment and we retract them dorsally as well, as you can see here. And then um, the brick radialis, sometimes it's, uh, it's a tendon, uh, sometimes it's a little bit flat. So if it's tendinous, then I would like to retract the brachial radialis dorsally as well. If it's, if it's like a very flat insertion, then I would just divide it right in the center. Then you come over the periosteum and then you uh, put your awl onto the, uh, onto the uh, 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 insertion point, which is just uh, around the metaphysis. You check it. Now, when you're the direction of insertion, you need to go from volar to dorsal, not the other way around, because if you plunge volarly, then there have been reports of um, uh, uh, median nerve injuries, there have been reports of uh, radial artery injuries. So you need to point your all going dorsal so that uh, you don't plunge in the volar direction. So that's how you take your entry point. Um, as, uh, as far as the nail size is concerned, we want the two nails of the same size. Um, each nail should be 40% of the canal diameter. Um, and for radius ulna, each nail should be two thirds of the canal diameter. So around 70%. Uh, we look at this uh, patient, 13 year old female who was right hand dominant, had a trampoline injury and a um, both bone forearm fracture, as you can see here. Now, if, um, 
here the canal is very small, you know, 1.8 millimeters. Usually our nails start at 1.75. You can use K wires as well, but it's difficult to insert K wires because their tips are sharp and they get caught into the, into the cortex. So um, nails are still better, but with a small nail, if you get incarceration or you get jammed here, you know, you can see what happened. We are trying to, you know, impact a nail which was not advancing because the canal size was too small, the nail diameter a little bit larger, and that led to uh, physiolysis or um, significant physio distraction. This patient did have a growth arrest afterwards. Um, and um, the learning point here is that if the nail doesn't advance, if you have an incarcerated nail, then don't try to just keep on hammering it. You can wait a little bit for stress relaxation. Um, you withdraw it, you rotate it and reinsert the nail or you can decrease the nail size. You can also use a short nail. You don't have to always go all the way across. I would uh, teach the residents that uh, how long you need to be is, you know, you measure the, the fracture width and two times the fracture width is how much you need to be across the fracture. Once you are across the fracture by that much distance, then it's pretty stable. And uh, the other thing what can happen with, uh, with a tight nail is that at the very end, when you put your last uh, blows to impact the nail, um, it can lead to fracture distraction. And that's one of the reasons why ulna is slow to heal is because once distracted, it would take a longer time. So most of the series showing non-union or delayed union would be on the ulnar side because the ulnar uh, isthmus or the narrowest part is distal to the fracture. So it gets a little bit tight around that. And when you, when you do your final uh, impaction, you would distract it if you're not really careful. So just make sure before you cut the nail that you don't have any distraction of the ulna. Uh, if the nail is too thin, that's also an issue. If it's undersized, it's not gonna maintain the fracture reduction. You can see that this patient uh, had a really small nail. And what happened with this is that the patient had a posterior montagia, it's type two. And uh, usually when you fix the ulna with a stout Steinman pin and regain its uh, straight ulna border, the radius can line up itself. But in this case, the, uh, the nail is not doing much except you know just maintaining the alignment, but not keeping it straight. So the elastic nails probably don't work well for montagia fractures because they are flexible. You need a rigid implant. You can either use a stout Steinman pin or a plate for this rather than using a thin, flexible uh, nail. Um, so this patient had revision um, and, uh, uh, and, um, and had some issues post-op, but um, not, uh, not related to the, um, to the last, not related to the ulnar fracture. Um, an example of a 10 year old boy. Now this fracture pattern, the metaphyseal diaphyseal fracture junction, it's a very difficult, difficult in the sense it's controversial what's the best implant because everything could be used here. You can put a plate, you can use K wires, you can use an X fix and you can use a nail. So everything can be used for this fracture. Um, if you're using a nail, what happens with elastic nail is that if you try to go all the way across and all the way along the length of the bone, your um, uh, distal part, distal fracture fragment is going to tilt uh, because the nail wants to take the shape of the, of, the, of the canal. So in this situation, it may be better to leave the nail short and not go all the way through because a short nail like this can maintain the reduction very well, as you can see here. So um, I have used a short nail at times purposely, not because I was not able to advance it, but if once you start advancing, you will see that the fracture reduction would be lost as the nail is taking the shape of the canal. So I would leave it here and then you, you're going to put a cast on. This patient you can see is, has a floating elbow injury, so has a supraconder as well. Um, but just a technical variation uh, using a short nail intentionally. There are new designs. I don't know. I've not seen this nail, but I've read about it. I don't know. A lot of times, uh, you know, we get, uh, we may get these nails uh, sooner in India rather than in the U.S. Uh, but this nail design, it's not circular. It's like uh, hemispherical, and it does uh, uh, have certain advantages uh, that uh, it decreases the malalignment by a factor of um, 
of five and 12 in two planes decrease the radiation because what happens is that a lot of times you have to take a flora just to see which side your tip is or which side the nail is pointing. Whereas if you have a nail which is like this, then just by the way you grasp it, you would know which side the tip is. So it would decrease uh, the operative time, fluoroscopy time, because uh, you would know which side the nail is pointing based on how it looks on the outside. And it, is be it has be better holding on the inserter as well. This was designed by Matazo's son. You know, I had... Um, I have a correspondence with him, and um, and it's it's interesting why he came up with this idea. And you know, they did uh, uh, biomechanical testing and found that this nail was better, but I've not seen it um, on the market yet. As far as the material, now we have both. We have implants, uh, the elastic nails, both in titanium and in stainless steel. You need to understand that stainless steel is twice as more rigid than a titanium. So it has advantages and disadvantages. So cost-wise, of course, stainless steel is cheaper than titanium. But if you want to maintain the elasticity, the titanium is much better than stainless steel. So in this example that I'm showing here, the nail was, it was difficult to put a nail through a two millimeter nail because when you start hammering it hard, the nail is going to bend because it's so elastic versus a stainless steel nail it might be easier to introduce and insert because it can take a little bit more hammering without, um, without uh, bending. But at the same time, uh, you can also have issues with a stainless steel nail. Here is uh, the uh, stress versus strain curve showing the elastic limit and the elastic modulus, modulus of titanium is half and bending stiffness of stainless steel nail is equivalent to titanium nail that is 0.5 millimeter larger. So the bending stiffness of say a three millimeter nail is the same as a 3.5 millimeter titanium nail. That means that you can use a, um, a smaller nail if you're using stainless steel and still have the same construct rigidity. When we compared the titanium and the stainless steel elastic nails uh, for pediatric femur fractures, the malunion rate was significantly higher with titanium. That may have to do with the with the rigidity of the construct. So what we we have both nails. So for upper extremity, I usually use uh, the uh, um, uh, titanium nails, and for lower extremity, I would use titanium unless the patient is uh, obese or is a uh, little bit older then I tend to use stainless steel nails because uh, of the high rates of malunion. And um, another study did not find a significant difference in time to union outcomes, uh, complication rate. Um, so, um, I, so I told you my preference. I don't think that it's significant increase in malunion rates, but there, there is some increase. So I would, I would start to think about stainless steel nails in heavier patients. Uh, and the stainless steel nail complication is iatrogenic combination, especially if you have a spiral fracture or if you have an undisplaced butterfly fragment. Um, I would try to use a titanium nail because of the rigidity of the stainless steel nail. You can separate that fragment, as you can see here, and that would make your fracture extremely unstable. You, you would convert um, a, uh, a long oblique or spiral fracture into a segmental fracture. Um, if you knock off that piece. Uh, for the same reason, I'll always um, recommend that you analyze the, uh, the, um, uh, the fracture on very good radiographs and very closely to identify fracture lines that you can otherwise not see, because that would help you to guide the nail away from that fracture line when you're inserting it so that you don't accidentally knock off that piece. So be careful, especially, you know, it's not too common in short oblique and transverse fractures, but when it comes to long oblique and spiral fractures, there may be extension of fracture lines going beyond the fracture that is displaced or apparent. So look at the x-rays really carefully to recognize those fracture lines and stay away from pointing your tip towards those fracture panes. When you do open reduction, you need to follow the patients closely. So here is a patient who had open reduction of the ulna and the patient had a delayed union slash non-union and at nine months, the patient fell. Now, is this a refracture or was this a non-union? I think this was a non-union. I've never seen an x-ray with completely healed fracture on this patient. So I think it was a non-union, but you can also make a case of refracture once the fracture is healed. The, um, 
Non-union is more on the ulnar side. I've hardly seen a report of non-union of the radius. Most of the reported cases are of the ulna. Um, and this patient underwent uh, plating. Um, if you do have um, a re-injury with the nails in site two with bending or displacement, there have been a couple of series where they have retained the nail, just uh, done close reduction of the fracture and the nail, and then put them in a cast and it has gone on to heal okay. So it's not like once you see the extra on the left, you have to revise it. It's not that you have to remove the nails and do something else. You can still try to bend it, you know, as if you can get it uh, well reduced and put it in a cast, then that's fine. Um, this is a series of ulna non union. Um, six patients had non union, um, and most of them were in the middle third of the ulna. F five were open reduced, one was an open fracture. And uh, the middle third of the ulna has a watershed zone for the interosseous circulation. Um, this was noted in 1998 in this article. And um, what that means is that uh, just like a scaphoid waste fracture, you have minimal blood supply, so you have higher rates of uh, non-union if the fracture is displaced, and a similar thing here in the middle third of the ulna. Now, if, uh, if you do have a non-union, what are you going to do? We had a discussion just this week about a patient which at nine months had not healed, and uh, one of uh, my partners, uh, she went and plated the patient because it had not healed. And uh, the point was that, can we just wait if the patient is not symptomatic and the fracture is not healed, even, you know, because the adult definition of non-union is six months, that if the fracture is not healed by six months, it is a non-union. Well, you know, in, in kids, especially for the online, if it is open reduced or if it's an open fracture, it may take longer than six months. So I, I wouldn't call it non-union in this particular setting. Uh, here is a case series of 10 patients who healed at 13 months post-op. And uh, what they have recommended is, is that if you see that your fracture is not healing, it may be that it's not related to biology or, or, your, uh, or your mechanical stability. It just could be that it's a slow healing bone. So you can just put them in a splint and tell them not to weight bear. Of course, you can revise them. You can bone graft, you can in, uh, plate it. But my personal experience is what has been reported here. I've got a couple of patients who went on to heal at around a year after um, elastic nailing. So I, you know, they were not symptomatic. I just used a removable, like a Velcro splint on them after the first few months. And eventually it did go on to heal. So I would be a little bit careful about, you know, labeling these patients with non-union and revising them. Uh, how about the dorsal entry? So I, my preference is to use uh, the radial entry for the uh, radius nail, but the other entry point that has been described is the, is a dorsal entry. Now, what happens with the dorsal entry, you know, the typical teaching in the past or the original Nancy manual was to bend the nails at 90 degrees. And then it was revised saying that, you know, you should be cutting it flush um, or along the curve of the metaphysis so that you decrease the prominence. And because the commonest complication is prominence of the nail. So it is recommended that you leave it flush. Now, the issue with leaving it flush in the dorsal compartment uh, at the wrist joint is that the extensor tendons are all gonna slide against the tip of the nail. So we reported this uh, five cases of, uh, of ruptures of the, um, of the EPL. Uh, one of them was my case, uh, my patient, um, and that's the only one that I'd done a elastic nailing, uh, nailing on because one of the fellows uh, wanted to do an elastic uh, a dorsal entry because he had done it in the past and said, this is a great technique. And we said, okay, so this was early on in 2010. And then that patient uh, had an EPL rupture. So uh, even if you don't have a rupture, here is, is an example of when we went to take, um, uh, take out one of the nails here, you can see the amount of uh, damage to the undersurface of the extensor tendon. And here is my patient. Um, then I referred the patient to my hand colleague who did um, a uh, transfer, but this is the EPL rupture um, you can see here. Um, even though you can take an entry just proximal to the Lister's uh, uh, tubercle, which is considered to be the bare spot, the recommendation uh, would be to bend the nail at 90 degrees. And this is uh, what my partner Conwall um, has uh, talked about, uh, is to bend the nail at 90 degrees so that the extensor tendons can slide around it and would not have any attrition. So this is what 
the um, what they've been doing at my institution when they're doing dorsal entry. I don't use dorsal entry, so I don't get a get the benefit of this technique. But uh, uh, two of our partners do it do dorsal entry, so they bend the nails at ninety degrees, and that prevents extensor tendon injuries. When we're talking about entry sites, I'll just point out about the tibia. You need to be careful about the proximal tibia because the tibial apophysis is coming much lower near your entry points. I always palpate the tibial tubercle and the fibula on the lateral side and go in the center and on the medial side, palpate the tibial tubercle and the posterior, posterior medial border and then go in the center so you are, that you are away from the tibial tubercle not to anterior. Uh, the reduction criteria for tibia are very stringent, the only five degrees acceptable in any plane just because uh, one, the bone is um, not, doesn't have that much of a muscular envelope. Uh, Malurin is not well tolerated in tibia. It's apparent as well as it does, uh, you know, affect the um, ankle joint. Uh, so you, you want to be careful about your reduction when it comes to, um, comes to tibia. Now, if, um, an example uh, or the, uh, an article about comparing the elastic nail versus ORIF of uh, pedia shaft, pedi uh, pediatric shaft fractures uh, from San Diego, and there was no difference in healing rates. ORIF had less, less angular deformities and um, less reoperation. Uh, nails had lower wound complications like you would expect and um, had shorter OR time. So that's another option for the tibia. If you don't feel comfortable, you can use uh, plates. Um, this is an interesting um, article about using a solid nail or a rigid nail in patients with open physis. So um, they have not seen any significant issues as long as the patient is nearing growth uh, or nearing maturity. So they had 36 adolescents with open proximal tibial physis, and it was 14 to 16 year age range. So I won't do it in someone who is, um, you know, prepubertal, uh, but. Uh, when they are in adolescent age group, 14 to 16 year age group, uh, they did not have any issues uh, with, uh, with physical arrest. Uh, three patients had compartment syndrome, but um, 14 patients uh, did have uh, some knee pain when they were running or kneeling. So, um, so this is an option compared to flex. I, I usually recommend flexible kneeling uh, because uh, uh, I don't like to go through the physis, even though they have not shown any issues with, uh, with, uh, uh, deformities, I think that that might alter the posterior slope if there is a um, uh, there is damage to the anterior tibial physis. Here in this article, they, they did not measure the posterior slope. They were just looking at uh, overall deformities or growth arrest. And my concern is that if you decrease the posterior slope, then it may just uh, you know have an effect on it later on. So I, I don't like to go through the proximal physis when it's open, but. Um, but there are there are other studies as well that have like just um, even for ACL there are a lot of studies doing transfacial ACL reconstruction for this age group patient so 14 to 16, 10 or stage four or five you can go through the um, through the physis. Iatrogenic uh, fracture especially when you're making your entry point you can go across and create an iatrogenic fracture like you have, you have seen here so it's always better to use fluoro make sure you're not malleting against uh, the um, against the cortex. If you're not advancing, you need to be careful. And during insertion, also, you need to be careful. Here is an e example of a patient uh, who had uh, nailing for a, uh, for a humerus shaft fracture. And you can see at the um, uh, entry site, uh, there was a fracture. Um, um, here is an 11-year-old uh, female patient. Uh, you know, you can see the fracture is pretty long oblique fracture and uh, didn't recognize these, uh, the fracture line that uh, went into the proximal uh, fragment. And when we try to insert the nail, now here, if you try to insert uh, nails from, from your normal retrograde fashion, just above the physis, it may be really difficult to get across a fracture because it's so low. So this is, um, this is a great case to get come anti-grade from the greater choke enter. Uh, so we passed one nail uh, distally, and then the second nail, uh, the plan was that will come from the top, like seen here. But that is when we knocked off this piece, and then the fracture became extremely unstable. So one, it was distal. Second, it was segmental. And 
we could not get the fracture to uh, to align or hold in spite of making attempts for about 45 minutes. So the point is that you can make a simple fracture complex and then you can make it extremely unstable and you may not be able to complete nailing uh, successfully. So you need to have a backup plan. In this patient, we then shifted to a traditional ORIF. So I just opened the fracture because I was concerned that the oblique or the segmental fracture was too displaced. So we use it into frag uh, screws here and then we put a plate on. But uh, the bottom line is that you need to have a backup plan for, for most of your patients. Like sometimes it's very simple, like a transverse fracture and if you're not able to advance the nail, you can open it and advance it. So you might not need uh, you know, backup, but most of the patients, and I'm pretty sure that the setup that you're in, you would have plates and screws available. So not a big issue, but you need to have uh, you know something in your mind if things don't work out for difficult fractures. The other thing is, uh, you know, this is a patient where uh, I've uh, I've walked in the room and the one nail was across and I said, let's look at the lateral view and here was the lateral view. So it's completely missed the um, the distal fragment um, and the fracture was, through, I mean, the nail was through the, uh, through the uh, proximal fragment only. So orthogonal fluoroscopy is extremely important, especially orthogonal fluoroscopy um, at the end of the nails, because you can see this, you know, on an AP view, you may think that the nail is in the uh, neck and it looks good, but this is the patient that had a sciatic nerve um, uh, issue because the nail has gone out posteriorly. So uh, in the femur, uh, because the femoral neck is antiverted, it's very important to make sure the nail is um, pointing anteriorly as well. Uh, otherwise you would go out uh, from the uh, from the back. Uh, nail prominence is an issue and can lead to a lot of things, including, um, you know, stiffness, uh, capsular um, uh, irritation and uh, swelling, um, and it can also lead to infection and skin um, uh, necrosis. Uh, here is a patient who came to me, uh, treated somewhere else, um, and um, uh, um, when he came, his nail was almost, you know, seen from the wound. I have one of my patients a couple of months ago. Um, had a similar thing that the, the fracture had collapsed and the nail almost came out was seen. Um, like if you just remove the slough, you could see the nail. So this is the commonest complication reported anywhere from 3% to 52%. So the pretty high rate, but these were a little bit older literature. So in the last uh, 15 years, you know, people have recognized um, the complications. So they don't bend, bend the nail too much. If you know that then a uh, fracture may collapse, you can use something prophylactic. Um, uh, this is how the nail used to be bent in the past. As per the manual, you can see a 90 degree bent so that it makes removal easy, but you can all, almost imagine how prominent or uh, you know how much issues this nail could create on the skin. And so the modification is to leave it flush, you know, not to bend the nail, leave it flush uh, over the metaphysis and that would make the prominence go away. Um, he is a 14 year old male who had um, my patient, he had uh, anti-grade nailing. Now, if, uh, what we didn't recognize is the, um, is the end of the nail. Um, and uh, we were able to remove one nail at six months um, uh, because one of the nail was uh, pretty deep on the choke enter. We were not able to locate it um, when we went to remove the nail. So we said, we'll just retain it. Uh, if we can't remove it, we don't want to create big holes and you know, just so that we have to remove it. I, we always explain the family beforehand that we may not be able to remove uh, both implants, or sometimes we may not be able to remove any implants if they are already buried in the underneath the bone. So there's a small chance that we may not be able to remove it. However, this patient then came back and complained of knee pain six months later. And then I got knee x-rays. Before that, I did not get knee x-rays because it's a femur fracture. You get femur x-rays and there is a little bit of um, a distortion at the knee. And when I looked at the knee x-rays, that is when I realized that this uh, the tip of the nail is, uh, is just proximal to the trochlea. And um, it could um, you know, irritate uh, the patella or it could um, um, uh, irritate the soft tissues in that area. So, but that also made our surgery easy because if it's a prominent, that means it's it's already out of the canal. 
then maybe we can withdraw the nail from the knee joint rather because we were not able to take it out from the hip joint um, uh, when we went to remove it at six months. And then six months later, the patient presented. So we just went around the knee and removed the nail, but it was prominent um, at the knee joint. Uh, as far as removing the nails, uh, you know, for pathologic fracture, when you're using it for, um, you know, a bone cyst or uh, any kind of uh, dysplasia or eye patients, you retain the nails. Uh, you know, uh, we don't routinely remove it for pathologic fractures. But in otherwise, uh, you know, healthy patients, uh, we tend to remove the nails. He is an example of a 13-year-old male who had a, a radius ulna fracture and had uh, had this nailing done, the fracture healed, um, but the nail you can see the both the nails are kind of buried in the bone, and uh, so we didn't do much, you know, um, didn't uh, uh, let him go, and we were not able to remove the nails. But then the patient came back four years later with an injury, and now he has this uh, fracture. Um, so this is an undisplaced fracture we treated in a cast, and the patient went on to heal okay. But two issues: one is that the nail, when it is in the metaphysis, it is it is okay. But when it migrates um, into the diaphysis, then it can erode the inner cortex, which, which which could be a stress riser. And that happens in younger patients when they have significant growth remaining, not too much in adolescent patients where um, uh, where the um, where the growth may not be there, but um, you have to be careful. We have seen that with uh, cancellous screws. Sometimes when we're fixing physal fractures, that when there when there is growth, the the screws which were placed in metaphysis when they migrate proximal or distal and then the diaphysis, then they are too long, causing irritation of tissues. So same thing here is it can erode the cortex. Uh, the second thing is that if this was a displaced fracture, it's extremely difficult to remove the nail, which is in the bone. You know, we can take advantage of the fracture site and remove the nail from the fracture, but that means that it's, uh, it's difficult to treat it unless you open these fractures. So that's the importance of uh, removing the hardware um, at, uh, uh, you know, once a fracture is healed, usually around six months. But if, you know, there is no consensus, means if someone is not taking out uh, the nails routinely, it is okay. Things like this don't happen too frequently. So you can't justify doing second surgeries on all patients to prevent, you know, 5% of issues. This patient went on to heal okay, just with, uh, with, just with a cast. Uh, two year, uh, a nine year old boy, two years post op. This is I showed you. And one of the tricks to remove the nail, if you can't, if you can't uh, identify the entire tip, is I use the uh, suction cannula over the tip of the nail. I put it on and then I bend the nail to 90 degrees, and that gives me a better chance to get a good hold and remove the nail. So I use the the suction tip uh, to bend the tip of the nail all the time. We have full videos uh, on view Mary, which are you know available for femur elastic nailing, uh, for for the entry sites for all long bones, including humerus frac, uh, humerus entry sites, radius ulna, tibia, so uh, on the cadaver. So you can look at the uh, anatomy and um, make sure that you don't injure any structures, especially when you're doing it percutaneous. And then there is a symposium that was done a while back, but these are these are on the website. So it's based on sound biomechanical principles and attention to detail is important. Um, you need to, you know, learn from all the complications and, um, and recognize and treat your complications. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Sheetal, for that lovely talk. I have heard it for many times, but I still learn something from uh, your talk every time. So. Gaurav and Meet, um, let's take questions first. So I would ask Meet to take the questions. Yes, sir. Uh, so we have a question by Molin, sir. Uh, for proximal femur entry, uh, should we take two separate entry points as suggested in the Nancy manual or a single entry window is okay? And also um, for a proximal ulna entry, uh, should the entry be uh, on the ulna side or the radial side? So um, for the uh, proximal, for the anterior kneeling of the femur, I prefer to use two, um, two separate uh, uh, 
points, entry points, but frequently what would happen is that when you insert the nails, they may just combine, may just join. Because one is that it's a little bit soft bone in that area. So you may start with two entry points, but they might just merge with each other once you're finished. You know? So if you've done a few, you would see that they always may not be two separate points. Um, but I start with two separate points. The other one, um, the other question about the um, ulna. So the entry for the ulna is is never on the on the uh, ulnar side because of your ulnar nerve. So it's almost always dorsal radial. There is another entry point which is straight, you know, from the olecranon. Like if you want to put a segment pin for the montage, you almost always have to come right from the uh, apophysis. The issue is irritation of the nail, you know, when you're putting your elbow against a hard surface. Um, but if you are going to use it for a short time and then remove it, then that's fine. Other uh, issue is, in theory, that you can damage the ulnar apophysis. Um, you know, if you're going straight, straight uh, down the ulna. So the preferred entry point is almost always dorsal radial. Okay. And uh, sir, uh, a question by Anil Agrawal, sir. Uh, what is the post-op protocol after forearm nailing, sir? Uh, most of the time, um, we don't, we just apply a splint for comfort or sometimes nothing for the transverse fractures, which are the most common configuration. So uh, if your fracture is stable, then I, we don't need to do anything. You just use a splint for comfort for the first two weeks. And after that, you can, uh, you know, use a Velcro splint uh, for, uh, for protection. Um, usually we don't cast them unless you feel like the nail is too small, the fracture is unstable, or if you have just used one nail is, you know, for both bone, you know, that's, that's also a possibility that you just nail the more displaced fracture and you don't dis, uh, nail the other one. So if you just are nailing one bone, then obviously you would need a cast. Uh, uh, if you have really proximal or distal fractures, you're going to need a cast post-op. So for the typical diaphyseal transverse fractures, you don't need uh, too much of protection. They are stable. But if anything else, then, you know, if it's unstable, I would recommend casting for at least three or four weeks post-op. And when you start, uh, I mean, when you allow them for sporting activities, uh, Sheetal, for this both bone forearm fracture? Uh, usually when you see a uh, complete healing, which is defined as, you know, healing on you know, both all four cortices and obliteration of the fracture line. So depending on the age, but typically three to four months is, is the time, especially in adolescent, it takes it a bit longer to see complete healing. In younger patients, it could be, you know, much quicker in those who are less than 10, it could be at uh, between two and a half, three months. But uh, I tell them that there is a risk of refracture for the diaphyseal, uh, you know, uh, fractures when they're going back to sports. Some of them would prefer to use a splint with activities just for, you know, psychological, you know, benefit. I don't know if there is any, you know, data suggesting that uh, it would prevent a refracture like a splint would. But um, of, some patients prefer to wear it. Um, there's, we also remove it at six months. So I tell them that, you know, one option is to just wait till we get the nails out and um, then go back because you can allow them to go back. Then, then there would be a two or three week interval when we remove the nail that they would have to stop sports at that time as well. Okay. Uh, and sir, uh, other than the eye of the enders, is there any difference uh, in the SS nails and the enders nail? Uh, well, uh, I've not... Uh, unless I, I, because I'm not used to ender snail, I've only seen stainless steel ender snail. I don't know if they might be making it in um, in titanium, but they are stainless steel implants and the sizes, they are not going down, you know, as long as I know, we used to use it for, for everything for adults. Because I don't, I've not seen really small ender snails. So like, you know, for sometimes we have to use two millimeter uh, elastic nails. Um, so I don't, maybe Maulin can, um, can tell his experience with enders. I've not used it for last 20 years. Yes. So we we have minimum size is three point five, and now there are some few companies which has come with two point five nails, but we don't have nails below two point five probably. So you know In we SS. frequently for forearm we have to use you know sometimes two point two five nails, two millimeter nails. So if you're doing femur, then probably you don't need to go that small. You're usually around three three point five, so it'll work for femur. But for smaller like for forearm, yeah, probably so forearm we used uh, then rush rods. Yes, there's another the option. Tip, tip is a problem, but uh, then we have to cut the tip and bend it a little bit. Yeah. 
sir uh, another question by molin sir sir do you protect uh, delayed unions in a brace sir yes i use a uh, so you can call it a brace i use a velcro forearm splint so it has um, a metal shank in it and you have velcro on it and that i use that for protection if it's a delayed union so like a thermoplastic splint you use? you can use thermoplast this is yeah. not this is pre made it's not thermoplast it's a it's a regular uh, uh brace with a metal shank in it and uh, velcro strap but you can use thermoplast it, and i think it would be okay to but but they should be protected so now from last i fix i learned that uh, if the fracture line is not obliterated then they can refracture so now uh, we advise families at the outset that we would wait till the uh, the radiologic healing for sporting activities and some patients we we put them in thermoplastic brace because they yeah, all same like with, play. same with uh, indications for removal of uh, the hardware we wait till the fracture line is not visible because we have seen that that you remove the nails and that had happened you know the previous recommendations um, original articles had said uh, earlier removal of the hardware and they had more refractures and then the revised right. guidelines were to wait a little bit longer so we usually wait for 6 months uh, you know more mainly for the for the forearm that's where the refracture rates are the femur you know we are not seeing too many issues with refractures yeah. but forearm refractures are there so wait a little bit longer to remove the implants uh, sir we have a question by dr chinmay sangoli sir uh, do you prefer to go for casting after nailing in forearm fractures um only if the fracture is unstable like after nailing i i think that there is more movement i check the rotation with the nails in i think that it's not perfect and there is movement then i would cast it otherwise it's okay not to cast them okay i think uh, uh, meet we should stop questions here we uh, chief gaurav can ask directly to sheetal later we have two interesting cases a quick cases and in one of them we need opinion from sheetal so sheenam you can share your screen and this is just uh, a bit of revision what uh, sheetal have uh, thought the and a question from dr kutub is what is your experience of only titanium implants in femur so we have been using only titanium implants in femur dr kutub uh, the you you joined late but the indications are less than 10 years less than 50 kg body weight we can uh, we can treat with elastic stable nail kya yeah, sheenam go ahead so sheenam is our current fellow sheetal and uh, she would present it seven year old male child presented to us with this uh, fracture after uh, he got stuck uh, with then vehicle so sheetal like how would uh, you read or you would uh, teach your fellows to read this what is the danger point or you know how would you teach your fellows about this x-ray so one is the amount of shortening like you know usually when you see shortening on um, either pre op x-rays or intra op when you do a telescoping test and you see shortening you expect that the fracture would go in the same uh, you know uh, displacement pattern after you fix it the fracture that means that there is significant soft tissue injury when you have so much of uh, shortening the other thing i was talking about looking at the fracture lines closely because you can knock off a piece here when there are long oblique or spiral fractures and you can make it a little bit more unstable than what it already is so in these uh, patients you know elastic nailing i think that's what i would do but i would be careful about your shortening part of it you know because of the length and stable nature of the fracture i see a lot of um, i don't know if this is like a lot of metal debris in there i won't be concerned about it but they may complicate your wound healing there might be some open injuries in those areas probably there are artifacts but what else is okay. the child all said ipsilateral uh, inferior pubic ramus fracture and there was hairline crack in iliac wing so it was an a bit high uh, velocity injury with significant shortening as you can see and there uh, and as you can see the third piece can separate uh, out so uh, i'm you, not really uh, sure about the inferior pubic rami fracture you know it, it may be just uh, the view you know because sometimes you can get a synchondrosis in that area okay you know this patient this patient may have it i'm just saying that you can yeah. sometimes see the synchondrosis it's not uh, and you can um, 
you, yeah. you can get to, you may think it's a fracture but it may be just a variation it was child had a bit of tenderness and swelling at that area also yeah, yeah. if it's clinically so, correlating then that's, yeah. that's but fine. of but, course it doesn't need any uh, intervention now uh, sheetal would you fix it with a uh, tens or can you decide preoperatively whether this would need something more than tens or it is your intraoperative decision you know it's a it's a good point the thing is that i have not used anything more than a tens in any patients yet so yeah. i've got a couple of patients who have collapsed later on if i think that um they would collapse. I keep a close follow-up and I tell the family, I'll see them back in a in couple of weeks. And if there is a collapse, I would do something. But I have not used an X-fix or a plate along with elastic nail. And I've been able to, um, you know, I'm fortunate to get away with just a little bit of a collapse. So just like a centimeter of shortening, which either the patient would not notice or you know, they would have time to catch up with that much of growth. So uh, I have not used it, but I would, you know, put them in a long like splint, maybe keep the knee a little bit flexed, you know, so they don't put any weight on it um, to protect them afterwards. So to your question, I've not used anything more than a 10. If I'm doing 10, 10 snail, I would just use 10 snail and not anything else. But I might change in future if, you know, if, uh, if it seems like I have more issues, then I don't mind using an X-Fix or a plate um, on top of it, because I've seen a lot of literature, uh, you know, coming out using tens with something else. But I personally, I don't use anything besides tens. Yeah, so this family was a bit difficult and I was pro using some, something beyond the nails, but my, one of my fellows gave me an idea can we take entry of 10th little proximal? So even if it collapsed, then also it won't cause the skin irritation. Now that was his question. But I said, no, let's let's do uh, uh, the the fine way. But that that's a question for you too. Can we take well, uh, you, know, do you, do you modify your technique when you expect them to collapse? I don't modify my technique because my issue is not a skin problem. You know, my main issue is a collapse and a length issue. That the, the shortening is an issue. So you're right that, you know, maybe if the fracture collapses and I can see the tip or the patient can tip, uh, can see the tip, probably it may be easier for us to convince the patient we need to go back compared to the patient not seeing the tip. You know, yeah. so that means if the tip is more prominent, if the fracture collapses, I can say, oh, you know, the nail has backed out, fracture has collapsed, you can see it. And the patient would agree, yeah, let's just go ahead and chain the nail or insert the nail again, compared to taking a proximal entry point, which you would have shortening and collapse because that's not going to change anything. Might be difficult to convince the family. I'm, I'm just, you know, I don't change anything. I'm just saying that it's, it's easy to sell an, a reoperation if there is something which is visible. Okay. Yeah, Sheenam, go ahead. Sure. Uh, we applied monolateral external fixator and flexi uh, and Anders Road placement was done in retrograde manner. So, Sheenam, yeah, we, we, sure. we found that there was a butterfly fragment you'll see. And you can first comment on this and then you can we can show you the lateral view. Can you show the lateral view, Shinan? Shinan has done a lot of work, but as we are short of time, I said you finish quickly. But this was the butterfly fragment, you know. Uh, yeah. And so you and know that that is that is common with the long frac long spiral or long oblique fractures, you know. Um uh, uh and um can you go back to the previous? Uh, go AP? back to the AP X-ray. So I, like, I, I like this configuration because one, it's in, it's in valgus. Your commonest deformity after, you know, length unstable fracture besides shortening is a procovatum and varus. So, you know, giving, putting the fracture in a valgus plane like this, it's beneficial. Though sometimes when you have two nails on the medial side and one the lateral, the fracture does want to go into varus. So, if you have a choice of putting more nails, I'll put more nails lateral and just one medial. If you have to balance it out, 
because I would prefer the fracture to go a little bit into valgus than varus. But I mean, the butterfly fragment is not going to be an issue if the length is maintained. That's all going to heal fine. So I'm not concerned about that. So I saw that butterfly fragment interop. So I decided to put in a monolateral external fixator. And uh, Gaurav asked why not tens and why enders. Uh, Gaurav's patient was economically compromised. And as you can see, like uh, uh, in this case, it's solving the purpose. It is jamming the canal. And we have made this configuration so that it would give this stability as well. Yeah, Shinam, show the post-op. So this is probably at one, three weeks when we saw some callus on the AP view. We removed the, the X-fix. Go ahead. Yeah, one slide back. So this is how it healed, Sheena, uh, Sheetal. Yeah. So, you know, you can see a little bit of a lengthening on that slide. So a little bit of, uh, that's what I was saying, that if you have one centimeter of collapse, I'm not really concerned because, the you know, it will lengthen later on because of the hyperemia from the fracture. And we have seen that even with uh, spica and uh, with loose nailing. If you have a very tight, like interlock nail, then of course it's not going to, you know, grow. But uh, with the flexible nailing, we have seen you know it get a yeah. little bit longer. So I'm not too much concerned about the length short. if it's if it's you know one one point five centimeter of shortening in a patient who is less than ten, it would it would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Next. So this is the final. Uh, yeah, as you can see. Yeah, so a little bit of uh, lengthening, but lengthening that, is there. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, probably that either the patient would not notice or it would equalize with time. This is a lateral view, and a uh, patient can do all movements uh, having full range of motion. So, um, all all these patients, when there are long long spiral or with comminution, I uh, I have been using X fix Sheetal because this patients they sometimes they don't understand that the, uh, this uh, length unstable and if nails back out then they think that there's a fault of surgeon so to be on safer side we put in monolateral x fix x fix and we have not seen stiffness as you can see most all these children they have good um, knee flexion and extension and we remove when do you, it when do you remove the x fix usually three to four weeks once i see some soft callus on ap and lateral view so three to yeah. four weeks is a time where we see uh, this callus and once and have, they have any X-fix, uh, Pin track infection or any issues have you seen? No, no, no. And we have not seen that. And once we put X fix, then, then we do not put a uh, back slab also. Splint also, we don't give. We just yeah. put a pillow underneath the X fix and support the limb in neutral position. That's that's what we do. How much yeah. uh, the uh, Jaydeep as Sheetal and Sheetal can tell how much time we should wait for limb length discrepancy, which has happened. Well, it is. It might not get uh, you know completely resolved, but you can see the trend in a year or you know in the one to two years. You will see a trend. If it's already catching up, then you don't need to worry about it. If it's staying or worsening, then you know that you have a problem. But usually, you know, between the first and the second year, you will see that it is resolved. Most of the time, it resolves. Anything yeah. less than one point five centimeter, it's fine. When it comes to two, then it's an issue. Yeah, so we see the same thing for osteomyelitis. We, we see lengthening of the limb after treatment. And most of them, they recover or readjust with the time. Now, Gaurav has question. Sometimes after putting the tens, I found instability. So I use X-Fix along. My question is how we can uh, judge when child is under anesthesia that it is stable, you know? Sometimes we see that once child is awake, with the muscle movement, it, it collapses. So you know, you my can, question you is, can, yeah. You can do a test, you know, you can do a telescoping test after you have inserted the nails and you can see if there is shortening or not. Or if you're really cautious and you, you think it is already unstable, then you don't do anything but protect the patient. That means you already know it's unstable because it, before, even if you don't do shortening, but you think that I'm very certain that if I do shortening, it is going to collapse. 
then you, you, I'm very cautious. You know, I explain the family. I put them in a posterior splint. Um, I ma- make sure that they are non-weight bearing, but it can still collapse. As I said, I just had a patient that had collapsed. I didn't do anything. I removed the nail because it was at three months. But the patient is about, you know, one and a half, two centimeters of shortening. And this is one after like two or three years. So I'm concerned. I, the patient is young, seven. So I think it would, you know, I've explained that between one and two years, it would catch up and we don't need to do anything. I just saw the patient yesterday at a five month follow up. Um, and uh, patient is doing fine. I mean, the frag, once the fracture is healed, they don't have any pain, but they do have, when you notice them walking, you would notice the limp, which the family says getting better. So it's on the going the right direction. But that's why I'm saying that I might change, you know, I've seen more literature about, um, you know, doing something uh, uh, X fix or, or plate, uh, you know, for length unstable fractures, but uh, I have not done it. Uh, but, but that yeah. would be your thing is put an X fix on. It doesn't take too long. It, you know, it has shown yeah. to be, uh, you know, uh, a pretty good alternative to not, you know, to, uh, to shortening. So might be a good idea to do that. Fine. Thanks, Sheenam. And sorry for cutting your presentation a bit short. We'll be uh, short of time. Thank you very much. Neet, can you share your uh, short, share your presentation now? Thank you, Sheena. Yeah, that was a good case. Thank you. And yeah, now, Sheetal, this is uh, one of my pediatric colleagues' uh, nephew who fell down. Uh, and yeah, Meet, you can start your presentation. Yes, sir. So Dr. Meet is another, uh, the second fellow who has recently joined here. So we have a nine and a half year old male. He had a history of fall from a bicycle and presented to us within four hours of injury with pain and swelling uh, and uh, visible deformity of the right forearm. So we performed the x-rays and this is what we found. Uh, as we can see, it is a closed uh, mid. It was a closed mid diaphyseal fracture of radius and ulna uh, and uh, with an apex uh, dorsal angulation. So just um, a few questions. So Sheetal, now how would you approach? Now this is a borderline age, nine and a half years. Physically, child is little bigger. Uh, the canal also is a bit uh, narrower in both the in one of the planes. I barely see a canal. So what would be your choice of treatment? Is it a closed fracture? Yeah, it's a closed fracture. Yeah, I would I would nail it based on the amount of displacement that the patient has. I would prefer elastic nail. I mean, your option is to do a closed reduction, but uh, you know, patient is bigger patient, then uh, it might be difficult. It might be a concern about compartment syndrome. Though even with, uh, you know, um, with uh, with elastic nailing, your compartment syndrome risk doesn't change too much. You know, you still have to make sure you observe this patient for 24 to 48 hours, especially if it's a high velocity injury and a displaced injury, um, you, know, you know, so that you have to be careful about that. But uh, once once 24 to 48 hours are, are, are gone and the patient has done well, then, um, you know, my my preference. I think you can you can always try a close reduction in any fracture. But you know, my my concern would be that um, it might not stay with the uh, with the bigger forearm, bigger kid. Then elastic nailing would be a good option. Now, looking at this canal at the diaphysis, Sheetal, I'm, I don't know whether you can see it well or not. But ulna as well as radius, the canals are very thin mm-hmm. and hardly so that- is made. Yeah, so that happens sometimes in refractures as well. Not in this case, but in refractures, you hardly have any canal. Then you have to think about your, you know, uh, the, sort of, uh, the, uh, the plate. Uh, you know, you can plate them if the canal is is significantly thin. But uh, you know, here I think you can still pass it. Uh, you know, we have we have uh, you know really small uh, elastic nails. I still, you know, I'm not able to uh, use K wires very well because of the tip. I, it almost always gets caught. But we have, uh, you know, sizes going down to like 1.75 on elastic nails. And yeah, so yeah. that is almost as good as a two millimeter K wire. So, you know, I think I can, I think I'll be able to pass that one. But if I'm struggling, my backup would be yeah. um, to open and plate it. We like, we have some of these children which are physically very uh, uh, strong, but their bones are very narrow. The canals are very narrow. 
and just putting 1.5 mm rush rod would be kind of very flimsy for that stature of child but they are at the borderline age so i thought that i would conserve him and we'll show you the sequential x-ray and you can guide further yeah meet go ahead so this was the immediate post op x-ray uh, we so, had given a upper elbow cast in the mid prone position so shital what do you think about this reduction i i tried to make this ulnar border straight as you have always taught us that you keep this ulna part straight and uh, we cast index we try to maintain and the contour of skin you, yeah i mean you, you know um, it's uh, i it this it looks okay right now but you know based on the way i'm seeing it it's it's likely to fall you know the radius is going to fall into it it seems like it would be one of one is a level second is the uh, same frac both fractures are at the same level same so level, it's, yeah. it's, it's it it is likely to you know go into the interosseous space the radius fracture as the ulna kind of angulates a little bit dorsally which are typical you know fracture angulations so you have to watch them closely you know and uh, we can see you know with if it maintains you know if this is what it's going to be at the end it's going to be fine you know but uh, it might and, keep on moving a little bit and now as you can see that i have to give uh, apply the cast in mid prone in order to have uh, the best alignment and we had this discussion in ifix that we should give it in in supination or little more supination than mid prone so uh no Let, i mean uh, i i think neutral to you know i think this is fine i mean you know the it's yeah. holding pretty good so i would not have done anything different okay. you know i i like to do neutral cast for most of the patients right so let let's see how it goes uh, meet you can go ahead so these are the x's on the fourth day post reduction yeah so still acceptable but you can see you know when it when it starts moving is when you are concerned that it would keep on moving okay so and the reason i one of the reason i said to fix it early on is also because of the fracture level so we have changed our practices you know for radius that is you know in the proximal half we are more you know aggressive about yeah. fixing those because you look at multiple papers and that that is a risk factor for uh, you know displacement after reduction is the level of the fracture because it's difficult to maintain these fractures especially when you say it's a big forearm it's difficult to maintain the even, even with a well placed cast all right so yeah. you know it is acceptable here but if it drifts more then it's an yeah. issue yeah. so yeah so this is one week and uh... yeah so you see the last the one on the right side is what i'm uh -huh. concerned about is that the ulna is drifting the radius falls into the interosseous space so now you now you have to fix it yeah so this uh so i called him that we may do a wedging or we may plan nailing and the child you know, the, they are giants and they had this uh, pollution and all and they came one week later so shinam i mean me show the last x ray so the, this two views and it two weeks i think this is holding uh i could see on my digital this x ray uh, with magnification that shows some callus in both the plane and the skin contour under, underneath the cast is looking okay at this point so did you change the cast did you reduce no, it no I, i have not actually i i have told them that you come nbm i might do a wedging or i might change it and if i was still worried about the canal of radius and ulna so i called them but this this was the x ray so i i have not changed the cast it's the same hmm and, interesting uh, because the one that that was on the previous x ray showed more yeah. displacement so, than this one so something uh, so there it, i we took three x ray in different rotations and one of the x ray showing but this is the pure ap and lateral views where it looks i mean the skin contour I, if i just neglect the bone and see the skin contour it looks okay at two weeks yeah and with no, it does look it does look okay on this one but it didn't look okay on the on yeah, the yeah that, that was an oblique uh, view okay so All what right. i have now planned is i will call the child next week and i will do it uh, check him under image intensifier and apply plastic about 20 to 30 degree supination 
so that uh, this child does not end with restricted supination or I mean, he must have functional supination and pronation he can, uh, uh, he can uh, compensate from the shoulder. If at all, it ends up into a kind of malunion, you know. What yeah, would so, you do? I mean, I mean so, you, yeah, yeah, I I do a similar thing. You know, when I when I am in doubt whether I need to fix or whether I need to um, continue, I I don't even take them to the OR. I take the cast off in the clinic, and I keep yeah. them. You know, keep the arm you know with me all the time so that there is no significant movement. Yeah. Uh, because I don't want them to move too much once the cast is taken off. But I carefully remove the cast. I check to make sure that there is no visible deformity and then right. there is no hard block to rotation. So, you know, uh, uh, usually at around uh, two and a half, three weeks, because then there is a little bit of uh, soft callus. Yeah. So then I just rotate the forearm and check it. If I don't see a hard stop, like, you know, that there is significant stiffness, then I know that, uh, you know, it would be okay. But if yeah. I don't, uh, you know, get to move it, so I, I do examine them clinically when I'm in doubt what I need to do. Take the cast down and check them in the clinic without taking them to the OR. Because once you're in the OR, you're tempted to do something. You know, yeah. that, you know, uh, if you're putting the patient to, to sleep, then the issue is whether you can, um, you know, uh, right. cast it. And, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, we looked at uh, consecutive patients that were, re-reduced in the OR without kneeling. And they did well because when you put them, you know, between two and three weeks, you can get a really good cast on. Uh, swelling is down. The fracture is already glued. So when you do a revision casting in the OR, it's you don't have to nail them. But uh, that is the issue is that a lot of people would nail them once they take them to the OR. But we, yeah. you know, we, we published uh, our re-displacement and recasting for these patients who are like borderline, you can get a little bit better correction without doing surgery, but under anesthesia. But to make that decision, I would kind of, you know, unless it's significantly off, like can you check them next week, if it's off, you got to do something. But if yeah. it stays this way and you have seen one bad x-ray, then you are you know, you're thinking in an oblique view, it might be, you know, worse than what you're seeing on AP and lateral, might be worth taking the cast off and checking them clinically how things are and then making yeah. a decision. So I, I was thinking to take him in OR and uh, do recasting a bit of supination, but now I, I can take it in clinic. So when you take plaster in, off in clinic, you get x-ray uh, or or you just- Not not, not without the cast. So you can get an x-ray before you take it down. Okay. Because if you see obvious displacement, then you are gonna do something that you would not be able to do in the clinic. Right, but right. If, if the x-ray is the same and then your concern is that you, because you had seen one bad view, your concern is that what if that is the real, you know, obliteration of the interosseous space and there would be stiffness. So if, the, if it looks like this, then um, I would just take the cast off in the clinic uh, and check the rotation. And then, you know, if the rotation is good, then you just put another cast on. You don't have to take them to the OR. But if, yeah. the, if the x-ray looks really bad or clinical examination shows that there is stiffness, then, you know, there is only a week, one week window. After that, once it is healed, then it's going to be difficult yeah. to reduce. Yeah, so that, that's a plan. And I will we'll update you, uh, uh, Shikal, Yeah, how, how so that would be good. So okay, interesting. I think, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. With that, uh, we come to the conclusion of this uh, nice session. And... Uh, I must uh, tell you, Sheetal, most of, we usually have 20, 25, now many people, general orthopedic surgeons from Ahmedabad and Gujarat, they have attended your, your uh, presentation. And through Ortho TV, it is being telecasted live uh, and, and many more orthopedicians would have benefited from your talk. And we, sure. keep your present, we, uh, we keep your presentation on our YouTube channel so that many people can see later on. So no, it is great. I mean, it's it's fun to discuss cases. It's always good to be back with everyone. And um, nice sessions. Thanks, Sheetal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Meet, Sheenam, and Gaurav for your uh, wonderful work. Thanks, Thanks Sheetal, you, for your valuable time. Thank you all. Bye. Take care.